Hello and welcome to Taxed and Wasted by the Australian Taxpayers Alliance. I'm Emilio Garcia and uh, here's Brian Marlowe, the Executive Director. How are you? I'm good. Yeah, well, before we start, because this is kind of a doom and gloom episode, tax cuts. Tax cuts are good. That's good. We got a few. We got a few. I mean, you know, as always, they're not enough and they're not Mm. big enough, Uh, but... It's a step in the right direction. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, it comes with a whole bunch of other bad stuff in the budget. But. Yes. So let's talk about that. Sure. Because JobMaker is a federal program that yes. was announced, something like $4 billion. Mm-hmm. And uh, it has people over 35 worried. So first of all, what is JobMaker? Sorry, JobMaker. Uh, JobMaker is a subsidy for the wage of new employees under 35. Mm. Why should that worry people over 35? Well... <laughs> Before we get started on that, I, mm. I, I'd just like to add, I, I, I like all the marketing terms they're using. So it's like job seeker, job keeper, job maker, job, I don't know, twerker or something <laughs> like that. Uh, and it it's one of these things that probably polled reasonably well. Mm. Uh, and they would have done some market research going, okay, you know, do people support the idea of the government helping workers? Yeah. And people say, they go, oh, yeah, you should help workers. Not in the form of handing money to people to employ people. Uh, what yeah. you should do Because you're essentially taking money from taxpayers and then assigning it to certain businesses. Mm. What you should do is just get out of their way and stop taxing them. Uh, So the implications are you've now got this weird scenario where people between the ages, I think it's like 20 to 35 or Mm. 18 to 35, uh, will get up to $200 per week per employee uh, just for having them on their books. Now, I don't know of many businesses that are going to go under over $200 a week difference. Right. Um, I actually think this is nothing more than a way to just artificially inject money into the economy and try and stave off the inevitable, which is all of the economic downturns as a result of locking down the entire country. Uh, So, you know, while I have some sympathy for the government who's trying to find a way to navigate out of this issue, we have a pretty clear indication of how you navigate out of this issue, which is stop shutting everything down. Yeah, and get out of our way. Yeah, and get out of our way. I mean... You know, I understand at the beginning when we didn't have good data on how this virus might mm. spread and the infection rates and, 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 you know, the case fatality rates. I understand that the impetus to go, look, this looks really bad. Yes. We need to shut down for a couple of weeks and mm. try and do what we can. But as evidence has come out, even the World Health Organization is now yes. saying lockdowns are bad. Right. Well, the quickest way to get out of this is just let business resume as usual. Yeah. Uh, but they're not letting that happen. And then what they're doing is going... Here's another handout, and here's another thing. Yeah, when really what you just funded need to do by is, us. Yeah, exactly. So it's like a you're kind of bribing people with their own money. Yes, so like we're injecting money into the economy because people need money, but also it's that money that we're getting, the pot of gold, is the people's money. Yeah. So <laughs> it, it, it's a, a, a friend of mine who's an accountant refers to it as intoxication, and what that intoxication, <laughs> and what that means yeah. is. Every financial year end, people get excited. They go, oh, I've got a $2,000 tax return this year. Yeah. I'm getting so much money. And it's like, no, that's that's money you would have had. Like, you would have had that for that year and been able to use that to further yourself. But the government took it mm. and then gave some of it back. It's actually even worse than that. It's the government taking an interest-free loan from you yes. the entire year. Yes. And then saying, by the way. Here's some of it back. Here's, exactly. And, like, and then why'd you, you take getting, it in the first place? And then you getting happy about it. Yeah. So it's the same thing here. I'm seeing some people that are quite happy about job mm-hmm. maker, and I, and I understand it. It's, sure. it's essentially, if you're a small business owner, it's mm-hmm. additional money into your accounts to help you operate your business. I get that. Mm. But wouldn't it be better if they just let you keep more of your money in the first place and got out of your way and eased up on certain restrictions? So, you know, in other countries we've seen, uh, what they've done is they've allowed outdoor trading mm. to exist. So they've gone, well... We know that this virus spreads indoors in close contact. Yeah. So you, cafe, cafe mm-hmm. you now can just operate out on the street level yeah. uh, without council restrictions around that. Mm. Why can't we do that here? Yeah, well, I mean, not to mention the fact, for example, that even some basic easing of restrictions when it comes to employing someone yes. would just naturally get more people in the workforce. Because, for example, today, to the credit, Woolworths said that they're not taking job maker money. Because yep. they said our operations were not disrupted by COVID <laughs> their, at their, all. Their revenue increased. Yeah, increased. So we're not taking it. It's like, yeah, that's fine. Yeah. But also you, because you have this huge human resources department, are not really affected by the government's stringent rules in employing people. So well, they actually benefit from... So yes. huge companies benefit from over-regulation because right. they have the capacity to 
employ huge government relation firms that can find carve outs for them mm -hmm. while the little guy gets screwed. Right. And so if I'm a cafe owner or if we own an advocacy organization, for example, it's really hard to employ someone because yep. there's a lot that can go wrong. There's a lot of paperwork you need to fill out. There's a lot that you need to know. Yeah. Just easing it. So it's like, oh, you pay this amount, like a person doing this job, this is how much you pay them and this is how much you have to give us. Yeah. And you know, and this is your flat tax. It doesn't matter if you make a dollar or a million dollars, yeah. you pay 15% or something like that. People would be on a level playing field and they'd get it. Yeah. 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 So um, again, job maker. And also like the part that we haven't touched on yet is people over 35 are now like, okay, well, now there's an incentive to employ people who are Yeah, it's a weird artificial incentive uh, that's taking it away from people who are quite experienced yeah. and giving it to people who may not have the same level of experience, but mm. hey, it's an extra couple of hundred bucks a week for the employer. Yeah, and I suppose maybe there's an argument which is like you're compensating for their lack of experience. So the people who are older... It's not the government's role to do that. I agree. No winners and losers, but I think that's the, the logic that they're using. Um, but speaking of you know terrible government logic... Uh, Foxtel, yes. massive company, yep, lots huge. of money in the bank. Uh, they got their government subsidy fast tracked. So as the rest of Australia is just waiting patiently for relief, tax relief or whatever they're entitled to now, Foxtel gets gets their uh, their money fast tracked. So what the hell is going on? Well, to be fair to Foxtel, mm. uh, they are a huge uh, factory that employs tens of thousands of people. Oh, wait, no, they just like run reruns of Seinfeld. Exactly. Um, On a meeting you know, that no one likes anymore. It goes back to what I was saying, which is yep. these huge firms have, you know, swarms of government relations consultants mm -hmm. that they can rely on to meet with MPs and yep. get them nice, cozy carve-out deals. Now, I don't think it's a case of corruption or anything like that. Yep. Ministers and MPs meet with hundreds of constituency groups all the time. Sure. Uh, and they have barely any time to really look at the detail. Mm. This probably would have just been a case of, you know, big firm with big government relations team yeah. pushing through a proposal and the minister just signing off on it. Yes. It's not ideal, but it, it, it's a good example of governments not treating money with respect because it's yeah. not their money. So they just piss <laughs> it up against a wall. And we mm. see it time and time again. And it, it, it's sort of... It brings me on to something that I like to bring up a lot in the office, which mm. is sometimes we, at the ATA we get attacked because we point out really small spending amounts in the global scheme of things. In, yeah. in, the, in the grand scheme of things, you know, spending a million dollars on a billboard when it should have cost 20 grand. Yeah. Well, a million dollars against the federal budget is nothing. Right. And people go, oh, that's just a drop in the ocean. Well, but it's representative right. of how ambivalent with taxpayer funds the government are. Yes. Uh, and it's, you know, I always bring it back to Sky Whale, where mm. it's like they spent $300,000 on a whale mm. that had tits exactly. to fly around Canberra. And then the government didn't even keep the freaking yeah, they tit didn't whale. Even, they, didn't, <laughs> they didn't keep the tit whale. Uh, the lady who made tit whale uh, oh. got to keep it because they screwed up the contract. Mm -hmm. And that was only $300,000. Uh, but it's representative of governments just not caring about how mm. they spend money, throwing it against the wall. Fast tracking things for people who get nice cozy deals. Yes, and you're paying for it. That's, and not, that's why it matters. Not to mention it's faulty logic because if you actually look at the government spending, because they have you know this is how much we spend on education, military, whatever. The biggest spend is welfare. Yeah. The second is miscellaneous. Yeah. If you actually go on the government's website, it itself says. The second largest expense is miscellaneous. So all those drops in the bucket that you say we shouldn't be talking about That's make up the second greatest expense in our country. Yeah. So we will. We, we make no apologies for going yeah. after stupid small spend. And by the way, even if it's small in the larger scheme of things, it's a million dollars. It's a lot of money. Is, yeah, exactly. No one would say like, oh, you're only going to give me a million dollars? Yeah, That's but not it's, very much compared to how much money there is in Australia. It's that well, case, <laughs> though, that when, when uh, you know, people look at like the, 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 the national debt... And you say, look, it's approaching a trillion dollars. People don't mm. know what that means. Because once you get beyond a certain number, for the average person, it's just additional digits. It doesn't have any effect. So yeah. it's like when you say to someone, well, you know, the budget went from $3 trillion in debt to $11 trillion. They don't see that as some huge increase. They're right. just like, oh, okay. Yeah. That's, that's just more numbers. Right. It's, uh, the way that they like to say it is like, you know, you know, it's hard for people to conceptualize the difference between like a million and a billion. Yeah. It's like a million seconds is three days and a billion seconds is like 36 years. Yeah. yeah so yeah. It, it actually does matter 
a lot. And is um, that the correct figures, or did you just like? Pull it's that out? something along those lines. I'm not. Okay. I'm not like because someone's going to be watching, and they're going to be actually, like, and uh, like, listen. Yeah, exactly. Don't. Emilio, I've done the calculations. Yeah. Anyway. It's okay. Uh, we wouldn't put opinions on the internet if we weren't willing to deal with, uh, you know, spurred uh, people coming yeah. after us. Regardless, man um, is wrong on the internet, nation. Shot yeah, exactly. Anger. Thirty-one point seven years. Thirty-one point seven yeah. years. Okay. Fact-checking. All right. Fact checking in real time. <laughs> Got that wrong, Emilio? Can we blur that out? Anyway, um, <laughs> since you talk about the one trillion dollars, uh, we're on track to get to one trillion dollars in debt. Yeah. And a lot of people, like, there's this, there's articles about, oh, well, economists say that's not a big deal. And Which the, economists? That's like, that's like, that's like being like, oh, my house has, like, leaking pipes everywhere, but this yeah. plumber says it's fine. Yeah, plumbers say. Plumbers say it's fine. So, yeah. Well, I don't know, my fucking kitchen's flooded. Yeah, exactly. So, the thing is, the, the, the logic they're using is, well, if you actually compare us to other nations, our debt-to-GDP ratio Oh, my God, that's even is, worse. That's, yeah. that, no, that's not an argument. That's like... That's like, oh, my house is on fire. Yeah, but if you compare it to these other house fires... If you compare it to the fires that we had If you in compare the it to Amazon, the Great Fire of London... <laughs> it was actually pretty bad. Chill. Yeah, yeah. Uh, obviously, it is a problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm not agreeing with no, that. No, I know. I know <laughs> just, you're not. It just, there seems to be this orthodoxy just that me, just takes place and suddenly people just spout it, which is like, well, economists say that optimal GDP, uh, debt-to-GDP ratios can go anywhere from 70% to 90%, and it's not a problem. Only above that does it present a problem. It's like, who decided that? And not to mention, debt is a huge issue. Well, but it's, <laughs> it, it may not necessarily be a huge issue for us. It's a huge hmm. issue for you. For uh, future generations, yeah. So you'll have people that are, you know, that are born, uh, get to a working age, mm. and their tax rates are through the roof because they're having to pay back debt from a generation prior. Mm-hmm. That's not fair, right? Uh, and it's one of the things that pisses me off is the Labor Party always talk about the fair share and the fair go, and mm. they always put fair at the beginning of yeah. stuff. They never quantify what that looks like. And then when you say, well, you're proposing all these spending measures, it has to be paid for. That's how it works. Mm -hmm. Uh, And if we're not paying it, someone else is. Then they don't respond to the fact that that someone else is going to be future generations and they're going to be taxed as shit. Of course. And I mean, two issues. A, they don't consider people's money to be their own. They're perfectly entitled to it. And B, they don't want to confuse people with the facts. Because if I say you should pay your fair share... That's a much more impactful statement than we should raise your tax rate to exactly this. Because yeah, once yeah. you actually propose a policy, it can be torn to shreds. And, you know, labor obviously is not one to want to actually have their policy positions be very clear because then they're easier to break apart, like all their terrible policies. Uh, most of them. We don't want to, you know, we're nonpartisan. Um, lastly. We're nonpartisan, but I don't like the labor. <laughs> well, we'll support them wherever they, they do things. Yeah, uh, sure. Okay, good, I guess. You know? <laughs> Don't like hold your if, breath. If the Labor, <laughs> if, yeah, if the Labor Party told me that, like, you know, puppies are cool, yeah. Yeah, they, I agree. They're pretty cool. But they're, yeah. like, now they want a puppy tax or something. <laughs> uh, a puppy excise. Uh, the government is terrible. We agree. They are also terrible at spending our money. There's a new Sydney airport that's going to be built. Because our airport currently, you know, is just... Our current airport's fine. We could just, again, ease restrictions on the current airport. Mm-hmm. It'd be fine. I don't think I've ever gone to the airport in Sydney and seen it very full. Even, like, Christmas time. It's, uh, yeah, it, uh, it, but it, apparently we need another one. Regardless. <laughs> so we bought some land to put the airport on. Because it's a big place. And we overpaid for it. Now, you'd think, well, we overpaid for it. What? We 20% above market value. or You know, something silly like 50. No, we paid 10 times more. So a thousand percent. Yes. How is it possible that the government can be bad at spending money? Because, you know, it's like they can well, it's, botch a lot of things, but spending money? So it's standard procurement stuff, right? Yeah. Which is, uh, again, there's a bureaucracy that's involved in, you know, land valuations and mm. then, you know, making purchases on behalf of the state yep. or on behalf of the federal government. Mm-hmm. And that person has no qualms about what gets thrown against it because right. it's not their money. They don't care. They get paid a hundred and something grand a year to sit mm. in an office, work from nine till whenever they get tired. Oh yeah. Uh, and you know, go home and put mayonnaise on their sandwiches. It's a little bit cause it's a little bit cause they think it's spicy. Um, and mm. you know, they, there's no impetus and there's no KPIs or there's no, there's no incentive rather yeah. for them to make sure they don't spend too much money. Correct. 
uh, KPIs not, being key performance indicators. Yeah, 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 but there's no incentive for them to, to, to actually be careful with taxpayer mm. funds. And you get this all the time. Uh, you know, as a personal anecdote, uh, a friend of mine used to work in government consulting. Uh, and when he first started out here, he was struggling to get a lot of government contracts. And he mm. was going, well, I'm proposing services that they need. Yeah. I know I can provide better services than where they're getting it from. And they know it too because they know what my history is like in other countries working for other governments, but I'm not getting it. Uh, and he spoke to some of his other friends who were getting government contracts and their response was, oh, well, we had a look at the proposals you put through. Your prices are too low which means the person who's overseeing this is thinking that you must be dodgy because everyone else is at, you know, yeah. 70 to 80% higher prices. Right. So jack your prices up and then they'll think that you're on equal footing. So it's this weird thing yeah. where, where these bureaucrats who are in charge of these sorts of things, they're used to wasting money. Yeah. Uh, so if you give them something that's at market value, yeah. they look at it and they go, it's too cheap. It, it, it'd be like... Yeah. If I went to, I don't know, go and get my car serviced mm. and it needed a new gearbox yeah. and my mechanic says it's going to cost five grand yeah. and then someone says, I can do it for a few hundred bucks. I'd go, whoa. Mm, that sounds off. That sounds like you're going to cut yeah. corners. Mm. Well, this is the mindset right. to a much worse degree. And they should know better because if that's your better. job, then you should know. But, you know, regardless, uh, we we're never surprised to see the government be bad at things. Uh, I, for example, am bad at timekeeping because we're already above time. But... Thank you to everyone who joined us today. Please, if you haven't already, make sure that you subscribe to Tax on and Wasted on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, really wherever you get your podcasts. Also, you can get us uh, the video version on Facebook and YouTube. And if you haven't already, please become a member. You can do so on our website, taxpayers.org.au. This has been Taxed and Wasted by the Australian Taxpayers Alliance. We'll see you next time. Brian, thank you. See you later.